The next section we're looking at is this concept, which we touched on earlier, and I think Sue raised it, the whole, you know, treatment is not a cure, busting the you've been fixed myth. Um, because what we know is that every patient who has had a heart attack now has heart disease. So the acute event as the indicator of a chronic condition, and I think a lot of people miss that very vital message that, you know, in that slide that we put up earlier about the acute event being almost the smallest part now of what we need to be doing for these patients. And we know the advances that we have in treatment these days for the acute event of heart attack, and as it's getting better and better, um, more people will survive. So the need for this kind of approach is becoming more and more important for people to not have another event and to go on to live a good quality of life. So having the conversation with patients, and I think we picked up on this a little bit earlier as well with some of the conversations we've been having around why aren't nurses, GPs, people having conversations with patients about prevention and secondary prevention. Um, we asked that question of uh, nurses in hospitals because we too were a bit puzzled to think, why, why is this so hard? It all makes sense. Why is it not happening? And what we discovered was that nurses felt that they didn't have the confidence to be able to have the conversation because they were worried about what they needed to say, how they needed to say it, and that if somebody was going to ask them a question they couldn't answer, would that be a really bad thing? So we thought about this for a little while at the Heart Foundation and spoke to various nurses and, and people out in the field, and we came up with this concept of the six steps to recovery. So it, was, it sounds like a really simple approach, which was, well, what are the real top six things people need to know before they leave hospital? And we worked with that as a concept, and we've come up with this resource, which is in your packs, um, to, to really assist nursing staff, but any health professional, to have a phase one conversation with a patient. So what I can really say from a practice nurse perspective is if you've picked up that the person has been discharged from hospital with a heart attack and this hasn't happened for them while they're in hospital, you have a real opportunity to do phase one in general practice. It doesn't have to happen in hospital. If it hasn't, it can, be, it can take place in a general practice setting. And I'll go through each of these steps with you um, to talk you through why we think each of these steps is important and, and what does each of these steps mean. So the first thing is to explain the diagnosis and procedure that this patient has had. Um, and again, you probably know this better than me, but uh, you, we make assumptions that because somebody has been in hospital and they've had a whole bunch of things done to them that they know what's gone on. And because, A, they've gone through a very traumatic experience, their likelihood of retaining information is a lot less than normal anyway. Um, but B is no one's probably had the opportunity to actually talk to them about it on a ward round or people coming in and out of their room doing OBS and all sorts of things. So explaining the diagnosis and the care instructions is a really critical part to recovery. Um, giving them an opportunity to ask questions and really explaining this point that this is not a cure for heart disease. They're very lucky, want of a better term, to have survived their heart attack. But there's a lot of work to do now to make sure that they lead a full and um, good quality of life. And that the patients have a key role to play in managing their condition around self-management, and that's why health professionals are there to support them to get back on track. Highlight the risk factors. Now, as we said earlier about, you know, who, who needs to go to a cardiac rehab program, I mean, you don't want to talk to somebody about quitting smoking if they're a non-smoker. So taking a bit of time to understand what are the relevant risk factors for this patient, um, discussing the clinical and lifestyle risk factors that are important for the management, and definitely here explain that value of attending cardiac rehabilitation. So the expectation is that you won't solve all of these problems, but that what you're doing is highlighting the fact that there's an opportunity for this patient to address these things, which would mean that they go on to be healthier into the future. And that cardiac rehab, phase two, as we know it, is the next step in the process. So this is that little short video that we watched earlier, emphasise the importance of cardiac rehab, and we, I think it was on the table there earlier when we had that conversation about, well, what would you say to a patient about cardiac rehab and why would they go? Um, those dot points that came through in the video um, are really the crucial ones about what, are, what do you learn by going to these programs and what are the benefit of these programs? Referring that patient to cardiac rehab if they haven't already been referred. We talked about that service directory model, so there's the ACRA side of the Heart Foundation side. But I'm not sure if you're aware um, that the Heart Foundation does have a helpline, that 1300 number. So it's a cost of a local call anywhere in Australia. And they have access to the directory um, if you don't. 
So either you can call on the patient's behalf or you can give them the number for the patient to call. And um, that uh, phone line is staffed by health professionals and they can answer any questions and provide access to any of the resources that are on our website. Um, and in most cases, they can be sent to the patient free of charge. So emphasising the importance of cardiac rehab phase two is step three. Step four is promoting medication adherence. And we saw with the reducing risk in heart disease guidelines how important medicines are for people who with, chronic, um, with coronary heart disease. Um, and getting patients to understand that most of these medicines, if not all, they will need to take for the rest of their life. And that can be pretty confronting for someone who has never taken medicines before. Um, and that some of these medicines may have side effects, but that they shouldn't stop taking these medicines until they've spoken to their GP. And again, there are some pretty horrifying statistics about the number of people who will stop medicines without telling their GP um, and uh, end up back in hospital. Because some of the medicines can have um, uncomfortable side effects, and we know it can take a time for, to adjust doses to manage some of those side effects or change the drugs um, to, to manage those side effects. So the last thing we want is someone to stop their medicines without telling um, a nurse, a doctor, their cardiologist about it. Educating on the warning signs of heart attack. When we were looking at the warning signs of heart attack campaign at the Heart Foundation, we thought, oh, well, you know, people who've already had a heart attack, we don't need to worry about them because they'll know what to do and they'll be able to recognise the second one. We found that they were no more likely, which is, again, pretty startling, um, to recognise their second heart attack than someone in the general community because the warning signs can be different, but also people tend to be a little bit in denial about wanting to go through all of that again. And plus, I've told I've been fixed, so why would it be my heart? So it, taking the time to give the patient the action plan, which you've got in your packs, again, you can download those in different languages from our website, and going through that stop, talk, call. The reason why talk is in there is because we know in most circumstances, it will be someone else who calls the ambulance on the patient's behalf. Um, so the role of the bystander and trying to get bystanders involved by telling people, I don't know, I'm just not feeling quite right. You know, I've got this sort of niggle in my shoulder and it's been there for a couple of days or whatever that might be, really can activate someone going, right, you know, I remember that conversation we had, um, I'm calling the ambulance or I think we need to do something about this. So that talk component is really important in the action plan. And hopefully you all agree with number six. <laughs> Encourage GP follow-up. So we want people to be linked to a GP. If they don't already have one, then they need to be linked with a GP before they leave hospital. Um, we know the value of discharge summaries, so hopefully you're getting those in your practices in a timely manner. If you're not, I know, I saw that reaction. <laughs> uh, if you're not, call the hospital and ask them where it is. Um, there's been a lot of time, energy and investment in hospitals to fix this issue of discharge summaries to general practice. So if they're still not getting it right, you need to keep giving them the feedback. You know, you're compromising care because we're not getting information from you. We need this information, when are we gonna get it? So that it's not reliant on the patient to try and communicate to you what happened to them in hospital, um, particularly around what medicines they're now on, what's been stopped, what's been started, you know, what they said to them um, while they were there. So they're the six steps. So I'm hoping what this allows you guys to do is to have that sort of confidence to think about, well, if phase one hasn't happened in hospital and I can have a role in starting the conversation with my patient, what would those things be? So the six, six steps resource is a guide to that. The DVD actually covers off each of those steps. So at the very least, you can loan that DVD out to someone um, to have a watch it at home or to play that in your waiting room or whatever, whatever works for you if you don't have the time to have that conversation. But we found the six steps from a hospital perspective has really improved the conversations that people have been having with patients before they're discharged. So hopefully, eventually, you'll see a bit of a change with the kind of um, support people are getting before they come to you. But if they haven't had it, please check and reinforce that. Okay. Yep, Sue. Yep. Oh, great. Yep. Oh, the DVD, sorry, yes, it is. Yes, yep. yep. Good. Excellent point, Sue. So what Sue was saying there is that the, um, the DVD also has options to um, different languages. Yep. Uh, peer support. Really, really important. Um, what we know about peer support is that it's something that health professionals can't offer patients. In other words, what I mean by that is, no matter how good you are, you can't be a peer to these people if you haven't had a shared experience. 
but it's really important as a health professional that we link people to others who have had a shared experience. And it's a really powerful way of motivating people to change. It's a powerful way of getting people to be less anxious and socially isolated. Um, and we know that it works, but people aren't being connected um, as effectively as they could. So we, we've done some work at the Heart Foundation to try and get people linked together around these supporting um, environments, peer support programs. And one of the things that we're doing now more recently is this Supporting Young Hearts program, which at the moment is sort of in Victoria, but the resources that we can send out and, uh, and link people to are electronic. So people across the country can get you know, the, this sort of electronic kind of support. What I mean by that is the information that we can send them that starts to get them to feel like there's, they're being linked to a community. They're set, we're setting up a Facebook page. Um, we're calling it Supporting Young Hearts because what we found was the peer support programs that are meeting face-to-face -face are generally an older population of people. Um, and people under the age of 40 uh, were really missing out on that opportunity to meet other people like them um, to get that peer support element. And this was really important for uh, people who were born with congenital heart conditions that were transitioning from the children's services to adult services. And a lot of those people get lost in the transition and this Supporting Young Hearts program is designed to help them. So um, what we've done that hopefully will be, um, sorry, that's this. Uh, in your packs, there's a postcard and we can send more of those postcards out to you if you find them useful that promotes this to uh, younger people um, with heart disease and living with a heart condition and that they can become connected online uh, and so we welcome you to promote that to anyone that you're seeing who you feel might be struggling, uh, who's in that under the 40 category. Oh, that's right, yeah. Tess, who runs the program for us, is, uh, is going to be here at the, uh, at the Saturday session. So patient support. So we have the, um, the range of brochures and information sheets. We've got a lot of information on our website. Um, a lot of those informations can be ordered from our helpline. Um, we've got the number there. And by visiting our website, you can find all of those resources there. The website is split into four professionals and there's another one for patients or for, for the community. Um, so if you go to the four professionals page, then you can search by the particular condition you're interested in and it will link you to all of our heart failure resources or all of our um, atrial fibrillation resources or you know, the, the plethora of stuff. Um, if it's not on there or you can't find it immediately, because that's one of the challenges when you've got a lot of information is how do you make sure people can find it all, please call the helpline and they'll be very happy to hear from you and, and help you find it. Um, so one of the key resources that we've got with, that we thought was worth highlighting is this, the My Heart, My Life resource. And it's a resource for patients and their families, which is really kind of the, the, the Bible of recovering from a heart attack. And um, that has, it's sort of a tabulated thing and it goes through everything that you could possibly think of um, that a patient might be interested to know once they've, they've had a heart attack and how they can get the support. It also has opportunities for them to fill in action plans and state the goals that they want to achieve and it becomes a bit of a, a workbook for them. And we have developed an app that again can be downloaded um, that uh, provides things particularly around medicines and things like that. So it's worth again promoting. And more recently we've developed a low literacy version because what we found was it's great to have the Bible of information but it can be a bit overwhelming for some people. So there's this Love Your Heart resource which is more of a quick simple guide, works along checklists. One of those checklists is what to discuss with your GP. Um, so it breaks things down and gives again people the confidence to ask the right questions and to get the information that they need. So you'll be pleased to know we've got another activity. <laughs> so we want to introduce you to Mike. So Mike is a 65-year-old man. He had a, an MI, a heart attack, nine months ago. His blood pressure is 145 over 90. At his last visit, he was prescribed a number of medications relating to his coronary heart disease risk factors. He's a lifelong smoker who has tried to stop, and he has managed to cut down, but he hasn't stopped. His BMI is 30, his waist measurement is 102 centimetres. He eats takeaway food about three to four times a week. He says he tries to walk for half an hour three times a week, but generally only manages to do this once a week. He's not clinically depressed, though socially isolated as he lives alone. So the 
what we'd like you to take 10 minutes to discuss is the fact that the GP that you work with has asked you to see Mike and look at assisting him to reduce his risk factors because as you saw from that list, there's cause for concern. You get the sense from talking to Mike that he's worried about his health, but he's struggling to know what to do. Question one that we'd like you to discuss at your tables is, what approach could you take with Mike? Question two, what are the tools and resources programs that would assist you to undertake this approach? How many other patients like Mike are in your practice? How would you find them? And what would you do to help them when you found them? So 10 minutes and then we'll do similarly what we did last time, just hear some top line thoughts or great suggestions that you've come up with. Thank you.
Okay, I might bring you back from the, uh, the conversations. So I've, um, so we might, might just start by, um, again, just, just hearing some highlights from, from the tables um, about what you think might be some pearls of wisdom to share with everybody. So um, can we start here first, around the pearls of wisdom? <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> no, well, I guess we can all see what he needs to do. Yes. But, um, the point that Tr Tracy made is that um, what does he want to see as his biggest priority? What does he want to do Great. about it? Yep. Yep. Um, he statistically is very much at risk of a second heart attack. Yes. Um, because he's got all those uh, high risk factors there, plus he's still within 12 months since he had the last one. Yep. So. We can see each of those points that you've got there, what he needs to do about it, and we could, but you have to wait until he's ready to do something about it yep. to have an effective... Um, That's right, response. yep. So that, that question about readiness is a really important one, and that question about what's, what does he feel should be a priority for him and how you can support him as his priority, um, and recognising that this is a tough thing for him to try and manage. Um, you know, it can be quite overwhelming when you've got so many issues about where do you start and, and having somebody else just tell you you need to do all of these now is not necessarily going to be the most helpful. Yep, that's really great insight. Thank you. Um, yep, thank you. Pearls of wisdom. I know there were quite a few on that table. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about using motivational interviewing and SMART goals to try and identify with him what he wanted to change because we talked little bit about telling doesn't always get the results that we want, we know it doesn't get the results we want, so it has to use a different approach in how we um, deal with this gentleman, perhaps. Yeah. I think the other thing which was really great discussion on the table was the fact that people come up with the excuse about why they can't do something. I'd love to do that, but I've got a really sore foot. Or, you know, so finding alternatives or responses to say, well, you don't have to walk 30 minutes in one go, you can actually start by five minutes, you know, so and build up from a particular position. That was a really great insight. Yeah. Uh, table up the back. I think you had a very creative solution. <laughs> we thought he'd, we'd attack his social isolation by um, maybe he suggesting he could buy a dog um, and get on it. <laughs> he he might meet someone at the dog park who can cook, <laughs> who can cook and um, exercise with him. Yeah. And yep. maybe um, a dating website might also be beneficial <laughs> in that regard. Yep. And, and, you know, that's actually founded in research. We know that people who own a dog are more likely to be more physically active than people who don't own a dog. And that dogs can be really companion animals and reduce your blood pressure and a whole range of other things. So as crazy as that sounds, it actually is scientifically valid. <laughs> Positive feedback. Brilliant. Yep. Yep. Great. Excellent point. Definitely. Point out the strengths, not just the weaknesses. Yep. Very good. Yep. And the final table. Pearls of wisdom haven't been covered already. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've mainly covered most. Yep. Do we, do we have anything else that we... Thanks. We mm. talked about uh, perhaps structuring our um, strategy for treatment for Mike um, by using a care plan so that he can at least access those allied health visits. And um, we'd structure that on what Mike was ready for and spoke about wanting to do... So um, it would be, you know, the dietitian and look at the sort of meals, lived on his own. Perhaps he could have, um, you know, those um, meals that get delivered. Yep, yeah, like the... Uh, yeah, yep, yep. not meals on wheels. The, um, light and easy, the, yep, yep, you know, light and easy. Poshy ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dear. So I think that was, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, and oh, and the DMMR for the medication review. And yep. perhaps a Webster pack might help him too to keep on track with that, make it easy for him. Brilliant. Really, all, all really excellent suggestions. And um, I think the, the overarching message here is there's no silver bullet that's going to fix everything simultaneously. So breaking it down um, and giving the person the greatest chance of success is really important. 
So um, we talked about what you can do in your practice, and these are some of those strategies around practice registers, uh, critical for case funding, fi uh, finding and monitoring progress. I think one of the tables suggested that it's not just important to support him in one appointment, but to follow up and review how he's progressing and what he's struggling with and how you problem solve the little things as they come up. Um, looking at the, identifying a champion within the practice to, to sort of drive those registers. Using the items that are available to you, which was discussed on that table there around um, uh, CDM items and also the, uh, the, the um, team care arrangements, et cetera. And the emerging role of nurse-led clinics, um, really powerful and a great opportunity for you as nurse champions to say to your practice, I can lead this area of work, I have the skills. Um, you know, I went to this workshop that Harry and Tracy did, so I'm an expert now and I can do all of this stuff. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's one of the things that we, it's an excellent question because we've got the answer to that one. So when we were thinking about these sort of, um, these, uh, these models, we thought, how would the practice pay for it? Because we know practices have to generate an income. It's the reality of the, the business. And um, so we've done the business model and practices who've done this can do it quite successfully. Yep. Um, local resources can include all of these things. So if they're not available directly in your practice, then looking at where they might be available through your community. Some of them are publicly available through your community health services. Well, Victoria has those, but there are other services across the country that can be publicly funded or accessed. Um, the Heart Foundation, just as a point, walking groups. There's walking groups all over Australia that you can access through our website. Um, so, and again, interesting work we did in Victoria when we did some service mapping uh, in it, within a local community, was it the lack of services that was the problem? It was often the fact that the services were there, but it was lack of subscription to these services. So a lot of them were floundering to get people to come along. So they're looking, most of these programs, particularly the walking groups, etc., are looking for people to join them. Okay. Oh, sorry, Sue. Yep. Yep. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, there are there are some alternatives, yeah. That's true, that, but the working, walking, so if you want it, sorry Sue, to interrupt, I was just gonna say, from the Heart Foundation perspective, they can support people to be set up as walking coordinators as part of the program. That covers that, all that stuff that you just described, so the insurance and the liabilities. Was it, did, was it, oh, sorry Sue, yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, the walking program is almost like a virtual network now, and so someone can be nominated as a coordinator and they get supported centrally um, to, to run their group uh, and to tick off all those boxes that you just mentioned. So I'll just move on because we, we're going to run out of time and I really want to get to this session with you, which is the, the session that I spoke about called Teach Back. And again, this addresses some of the discussions that you had about Mike. So how do you have a conversation with Mike and how do you um, know that Mike's really understood what you've wanted to say um, and the message that you've wanted to? And I think I've just switched this off or something. Haven't I? Yep. So addressing the barriers to Teach Back. So there's a really interesting phenomenon that we're noticing now around this concept of health literacy. And um, a lot of people think that health literacy is pretty obvious. It's usually about people who have had a low education must also be low in health literacy. But the, way, the example that I like to use is all of us in this room are university educated. And when you take your car for a service, if the mechanic was to pull you in the service area and says to you, this is the carburetor and this, I've just done this and I've flushed these fuel lines and what's your opinion about this? Do you want it fixed or not? Your response is gonna be, I have no idea what you're pointing at and what that is, even though we've all got a university degree. And this is the same with patients, okay? A health, um, uh, something to do with health 
is a completely new domain, it's a new language, and we need to know that those people may be struggling to understand some of the th things that we think are really straightforward and easy. And this is what this teach-back methodology um, assists us to think about when we're talking to patients. Because we know that although 80% of us think that the patient is understood, in reality, and this is a study that found only 37% of those patients reported that they actually understood. So there's a gap there about what we think patients are understanding and what's actually happening. So, you know, and this is, I like this cartoon, because this is about someone who was told um, you need to get on the scales every morning. Um, and, and some of the, the kind of things that we then overlay on this phenomenon is, look, the patient's not compliant. You know, we tell them what to do, and they're just not interested. Um, you know, but what is our responsibility as the sender of this information? If we start from a position that says most patients will want to feel better, they want to try and do the right thing, and they want to be engaged, then that non-compliant patient is a not good place to start. You really want to start from that point of view of how do I get them um, as engaged as possible. And the way that we look at that is to use this concept of universal precautions, which we're all really good around infection control. So, you know, everyone's got something until they've proven they haven't. So we, we, we're very careful about how we manage things that might be infectious. And this is the same, a similar sort of concept when you're looking at communications with patients. So you're assuming that everyone has low health literacy um, until you get to the part of the conversation where you think, oh, okay, this person has a lot more health literacy than I thought, so I can start using bigger concept and bigger terms. But until you've confirmed that, everyone has low health literacy, and that's that concept of the universal conversion curve. So you can't tell by looking at someone. Um, you can communicate clearly with everyone and confirm understanding with everyone. That's the universal precaution. So who does the benefits for? So the client that helps the patient better understand how to self-manage their condition. You as a health professional gives you insight on how clients understand and apply the information. This is teach back. And the relationship, it promotes the conversation, builds trust and rapport. And we've talked a lot about conversations in this session because they are really powerful. Um, and that's where it all starts from. So don't underestimate the power of the conversation. You don't always feel like you have to have some sort of magic therapeutic cure. Just by having a conversation, that can be a therapy in and of itself. So there's evidence to support that this is, um, this is real and not just something we've imagined. So we know that through this teach-back methodology um, in education, there's reduced medication errors, improved self-management um, by nurses identifying when patients didn't understand. It improves glycemic control in people with diabetes, asthma, um, and improves self-management retention for people with heart failure. So it is a very sound uh, methodology to be using with your patients. I'll just play you this really, what I think is a funny video. Well, sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? Nope. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? <laughs> now that's extreme, but that is actually an example of the person was told that they use an inhaler, you puff it, and that's exactly what she was doing. And so she thought that she was using her inhaler appropriately. And I guess, you know, his approach wasn't the, the best approach that could be taken um, as far as having a conversation with your patient. Um, and I think what really happened there was that the patient automatically felt like they were being treated like an idiot. Do you think I don't understand? You know, of course I understand, I'm not an idiot. So the, the question there is looking at that as an extreme example about what are the things that you can do to make sure that you don't fall into the same trap about that dynamic that was set up with that particular patient. And these are some of those areas that really um, you can think through. So the strategies for effective communication, don't assume an understanding. So assumptions really lead to dangerous areas because you're not checking in, so there's, you, you can't be sure if you're just assuming. Slow down, okay. Um, how you come across around the way that you phrase questions and how the patient feels about receiving those questions, i.e. she felt like she was being treated like an idiot and we certainly don't want patients to feel that way. That people have different learning styles and when you're talking to adults, that adult learning is quite different to children's learning and that people like to, some people like to receive information visually, some people like it practically. For example, 
the best way to make sure that someone's using their inhaler correctly is to get them to demonstrate how they're using it. Um, and I'm sure, again, you guys probably do this already, but again, it just reinforces that just telling someone, this is how you use an inhaler, it's far more effective to just say, this is how you use an inhaler, and here's a demonstration. Um, so that way you, you know that you've used the visual learning plus the oral learning um, and the auditory learning. So combining as many of those styles together gives you the greatest chance of success to make sure that you've touched on the way that that person learns best. Prioritise information, and we talked about this with Mike. You can't have a conversation with Mike about the 20 things he's doing wrong in 15 minutes. You know, pick the ones that you want to prioritise and cut them down so that you're having no more than one, two, three priorities within a conversation. And always assess the baseline level of understanding so that you know what, what the point is where this person's at that you can you, you leverage off and how do you get them to a baseline where you can start to do the other stuff. Has, uh, just a show of hands, has people heard about the teach back methodology before? Has anyone used it? Yep, person in the audience. Just as a quick thing, have, have you found it worthwhile? Oh, sorry, yep, yep, great. So hopefully after this session you'll be able to use it. Um, so there's, it, it, again, the methodology outlines these steps. So teach back steps are one, use simple terms to explain and demonstrate, again, adult learning and the different styles. Ask the person to repeat back what you've said in their own words. Identify and address any misunderstandings when they've repeated those things back to you. So if you've picked up when they've repeated something, you will say, actually, that wasn't quite the way it should be. I, I might need to explain that to you again. Ask the person to repeat everything back to you in their own words. Really important that it's in their own words. And repeat the process until understanding is achieved. So whenever you hit a barrier that you've went, you haven't got that quite right, let me explain that to you again. Can you now explain it to me? And there's techniques to do this. Um, is, is, and I'll, I'll get another short video for you that you puts those techniques into action really well. But they're the steps, and those steps can be cyclical depending on what you're trying to teach patients. So step one, use simple terms to explain and demonstrate. Try and get rid of any of that medical jargon that we use. Clarify the meanings of things. Avoid acronyms. Avoid um, words with multiple meanings, particularly around that sort of thing about yeah, yeah, a negative result. So negative means bad, but a negative result can actually be a good thing, you know, particularly in blood tests. Um, diet. You know, diet often people relate to restricting food and as opposed to what's good for you and a good diet. Even that term stool, you know, most people think it's something you sit on, which is quite right. Um, and then breaking things down into short statements. Ask patients to demonstrate understanding in their own words. And make, don't make it feel like a test. It's not about testing the patient. It's about saying, look, I just want to make sure that I've done my job right. Can you just explain back to me what I've said to you? Or, you know, I'd really like to hear in your own words what we've just talked about today because I'm really, you know, this is really important and I'll make sure we've got it right. Those sorts of things. Where the person then becomes the teacher either to you or to someone else that you're asking them to demonstrate that to. And open-ended questions are the best. Um, you know, avoid yes-no questions or do you understand. Um, again, they can be quite threatening. So some of the other alternatives could be, I want to make sure I explained everything clearly. Can you please explain it back to me so I can see whether I did or not? What will you tell your husband about the way you need to manage your fluid or your daughter or you know, how you're going to communicate this back to your family? We've covered a lot of information about you managing your fluid intake. So this is about fluid intake and heart failure. Can you let me know how you will make it work at home for you? So that classic thing about what are you going to do Monday morning? So we've talked about all this today. What are you going to do Monday morning? Tell me about what your morning's going to look like if you talk to them about something that they need to act in the morning or the afternoon. Really powerful ways for you, again, to see how this person's going to put that information into practice. And it's very different to, have you understood what I've told you? Yep. Um, identify and address any misunderstandings. So if through this process you've noticed that they haven't got something quite right, um, so you go backtrack and say, I haven't been clear in regard to that part, or what I meant was that, or I may have confused you a little because there's a lot of information and it's hard to take in. So trying to rephrase and use different approaches so if you've tried to do it all visually and you realise this person needs written information to take home and read, that's fine to provide. Or if you've tried to explain it, having a practical demonstration is probably going to be far more effective than trying to explain it more slowly or more loudly the next time. Yep. And ask the person to repeat everything back in their own words again so that you get the confidence that they've actually understood. And one of the areas that really helps um, this 
methodology is to limit the kind of information that you're presenting as part of this teach back. And there's this idea of the chunk and check method, so that you're never um, talking about two or more than two to three main points for the first concept checking understanding and then going back to the next concept so that you're not trying to do teach back with six things, you're doing it hopefully with just a couple of things to make sure that that learning is reinforced. And then when you're confident that they have understood, you move on to the next part because it's better for them to understand two things really well than six things, not at all. Yep, so that's that chunk and check methodology. Okay, we're not getting another break, are we, Tracy? Sorry, sorry, that was just to tease you all. <laughs> Um, so what I'll do is, so that just really uh, is a nice summary, that, that slide there, and I know you've been going through the slide pack, so these are all there for you as well. Um, just a reminder, if you want to put this up on the wall or somewhere, um, about how this works in practice. And what I will show you is an example. Um, so it's a, a nice video that's been produced by St Vincent's Hospital. Now, it, it uses Hep B as the, um, the, the disease group or the patient group but just recognising that it doesn't matter what you're talking about, it's the, the way that it's being discussed and how it works. So hopefully you'll find this useful. Some water for you, Achai. Thank you. So, Achai, we've talked. So Achai, I want to check that I've explained everything properly to you. Can you please explain to me in your own words some of the ways that you can't pass hepatitis B on to others? Yep, yeah, by sharing plates, mm -hmm. eating together, holding hands mm -hmm. and hugging. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell my sister now that it's okay to play with their children without worry. Yes, that's great. It's perfectly safe to play with your nieces and nephews and to be affectionate with them and to share meals. So Achai, I want to check again that I've explained things properly. Can you tell me in your own words what tests or checkups you need to have? I need to have blood tests every six months to check if my liver is okay. Yes, that's right, that's very important. But we talked about some other tests as well. If someone in your family asks you what tests you need to have, what would you say to them? Oh, okay. Do I need more tests? You also need to have an ultrasound scan every six months. So I need two tests every six months? Yep, that's right. So the ultrasound scan is a type of photo and it, we look at that to see if there's any lumps on your liver. So an ultrasound to see if my liver is okay? That's it. So two tests every six months, perhaps to help you remember, perhaps one lot in winter time and then one lot in summer time. So Achai, let's just have a look at this book again. We had a look at this before and we talked about some of the things that you can do yourself at home to keep your liver well and healthy. So um, I just want to check I've explained properly. If someone in your family asked you what you can do yourself to keep well, what sort of things would you say to them? Eating plenty of healthy food, mm -hmm. um, no alcohol mm -hmm. and exercise. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Good, great. So hopefully you found that useful as a bit of a sort of a demonstration about how that can work into practice. And, and you saw the language that was being used by that health professional to sort of say, you know, what are you going to say to somebody if they ask you that question? How can you remember things about the kind of tests that you need and when you might need them? Uh, and then checking back in when she hasn't completely understood that she needs two tests, not just the one. So that's, that's what it looks like in practice. So you can see it shouldn't take any longer than, you know, than a consultation but it's a case of only moving on to the next step when you're confident that they've understood that previous step. Um, and, and that was the technique that they've used. So the exciting part is you're gonna have a, a chance to have a go at this um, on your tables. So we ask that you um, all have a think about Teresa. Um, she had a heart attack three months ago. Her cardiologist explained to Teresa that the chest pain she's experiencing is this thing called angina. Teresa has been prescribed anginine amongst her other medications. The barrier here is that Teresa has been visiting the practice very concerned about her chest pain. She's worried about having another heart attack. So even though this has been explained to her by the cardiologist, Teresa seems very anxious about it. So the task is to explain to Teresa why she is getting chest pain, how she should be using her anginine, and that the chest pain action plan that's in your pack it can be used to reassure her about her symptoms and when, it, when it's important to call triple zero. So we'd really love you to break into groups of, well, there's a group, a group of two on your table. <laughs> um, so a group of three um, or two, whichever way your, your table is split up. So it's good to have one person being the patient, one person being the nurse, and a person being an observer that can reflect on those. And then what will get you to talk back to us um, as a group is what you found worked well in that role play or also what were some of the challenges that you think you might need to think about as you're putting this into practice. So we won't spend too much time on it just to give you a chance to go through those things. And if I can go back there. So it's explaining to Teresa why she's getting chest pain, how she should be using her anginine and the chest pain action plan to reassure her about her symptoms. So the nurse needs to know that. One of you needs to be role playing as the patient um, somebody who's been struggling to understand this, and the observer can just um, provide helpful hints as that conversation's happening. Great, should we go? Thank you. Okay, um, so we're at the tail end of it all, so thank you for staying engaged as long as you have, and I sat in on that tables conversation, and um, I think it's a really good idea to practice these things because it throws up some of the challenges that you might be facing in trying to put this into practice. There's some of the challenges that we've sort of um, identified as part of this, this work. Do people, just mindful of time, do people want to talk about one challenge that they found, the, the most challenging about trying to use this teach back methodology? Might start from here. Sue's table. <laughs> Language barrier, yep, real challenge. That's why sometimes interpreters, well not sometimes, but if there's a language barrier, interpreters are absolutely essential. Um, point. <laughs> yep. So that's jargon, exactly. So getting rid of that jargon, getting someone to demonstrate what that means. You know, talked about having the, the tablets there or the, the sublingual spray to demonstrate how it would work. Yep. Challenge from this table? Yep. You don't want people to feel like they're being patronised. And that's really important. Yep because we, we don't want people to feel like you're treating them like an idiot. And I think the really important thing is that health literacy is not about talking down to people or dumbing things down. You know, that, that's not the terminology that we use for health literacy. It's really about how you explain things in a, the simplest possible way for people who aren't health professionals. Yep, good point. Um, middle table, key challenge. None, was all easy. <laughs> So if this wasn't one that sort of sprung to mind, that's great, yep. Um, how to use it pro appropriately, yep. And we know, it, and I think we picked that up on this table too, is that it's kind of a complicated message, take one, wait, take the second one, wait. You know, it's not better, take the third call, yep, how they're spraying it, you know, all that sort of stuff. So 
that's where that chunk and check methodology is really important so that the first step would be let's just get you to understand how you would do it before we start talking about wait five minutes and do it again. Let's just get the first go right before we start talking about and then when to call triple zero. So that's the chunk and check methodology. You wouldn't start talking about take the third call until you understand that they can take the medication appropriately in the first place. And the back table? retention of knowledge and being able to apply that knowledge, which is really important. And that show me, like we saw in that original video, although he didn't approach it in the right way, is a really powerful thing, you know. So show me how you do it, um, I'd like to see, because there's obviously something not quite right between what you're telling me you're doing and the effect that, we, that we're seeing the medicine having on for you. So I hope that's useful. Um, you know, as I said, there's some of the thing around the, the barriers that, and, and it takes practice. I think this is the other thing too, is that like all things when you're looking to implement change, it takes practice. Um, and don't feel that because you don't get it perfectly right on the first time that it's not worth continuing to try and give this a go. So the reflections there are how will you ask questions so patients don't feel tested? We said don't feel like an idiot. How will you prioritise the information? So thinking straight ahead, what are the three things I want to talk to you about today? rather than the 20, how will you apply to back to your clinical setting? What do I do Monday morning? This is a classic one around trying to motivate you to also your own motivation about choosing one thing that you will change and sticking to that one as a starting point. And you know, how do you, how do you support each other as colleagues to get this um, into practice? So as a closing sort of bit of reflection um, and what we really want you to think about as your own teach back chunk and check methodology, just having a reflection on what are the two to three things that you got out of today that you feel could have the biggest influence on your practice that might make a big difference? And what do you need to do as a first step to make it happen? So please think that through because we want what you've um, experienced with us today to influence how you practice or what you take back um, so that patients get the, the outcomes of what you've hopefully learnt with us today. Um, so we'll give you that as a reflection and um, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you very much for your really active participation in your engagement. It's been a pleasure meeting you all um, and from a Heart Foundation perspective, we are very committed to supporting practice nurses, all health professionals, particularly practices and practice nurses. We see your potential to have a real influence in cardiac care and how people um, have their cardiac care managed after a heart attack, but, a cent but also about how we prevent more people from going on to have a heart attack. We know that 80% of heart disease is preventable if people are getting the right sort of information and being assisted to change some of their lifestyle behaviour. And I think Rebecca said earlier, the conference um, over the next couple of days will have some of those key opportunities to hear about motivational interviewing and a whole range of things that help you in your practice. So thank you all very much. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, and Hobart and hopefully we'll run into each other again at some stage um, and if in doubt just call our helpline and you'll be linked to any of the resources that we've discussed today. Thank you. <laughs>